this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Pop quiz. No, I'm just kidding. What tribe is Joshua from? Ephraim. If you turn over to Numbers chapter 13, you will find that Joshua is sent out as the representative of Ephraim. Now, this is the real pop quiz. Ephraim is the son of which, or is, is the son of which son of Jacob? I heard it. Joseph. Y'all pass with flying colors. <laughs> Joshua is a son of Ephraim. Ephraim is a son of Joseph. Joseph was the first son of what wife? Rachel. And Joseph would receive a double portion, correct? Yes. Jacob would, would bless Joseph, and he would tell Joseph that you will by essentially him adopting Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, Jacob, towards the end of his life, will, will go through a process that is essentially taking those two sons of Joseph as his own. You will have Ephraim and Manasseh, who were not direct sons of Jacob, but they will become adopted sons, in a sense, and become tribes of the nation of Israel. In such, we notice something with, and we've already noticed it with Manasseh, and that is that Manasseh will grow into such a large tribe that they will end up with half of their tribe in 60 cities on the east side of Jordan and half of their tribe on the west side of Jordan. But one of the things that you find is when you look in chapter 18... sorry, chapter 17, when Manasseh and Ephraim receive their portion on the west side of the Jordan, they receive it together. Notice what we read. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, chapter 17, verse 1, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. Namely, for Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore, he was given Gilead and Bashan. There, and there was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh, according to their families, for the children of Abiezer, the children of Helech, the children of uh, Azrael, the children of Shechem, the children of Hefer, and the children of she, uh, Shemedi, Shemedi, these were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, according to their families. But Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of the daughters, uh, Mela, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. And they came near before Eliezer, the priest, before Joshua, the son of Nun, and before the rulers, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave, a, gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. Ten shares fell to Manasseh beside the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of the Jordan. Because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons, and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. And the territory of Manasseh was from Asher to Mikmethath, uh, that lies east of Shechem, and the border went along south to the inhabitants of Entupa. Manasseh had the land of Tupa, but Tapua, that's Tapua, uh, on the border of Manasseh belong to the children of Ephraim. So they've got, they've got an inheritance and it butts up to one another. But you notice what they're going to say about it here in just a little bit. And the border descended to the brook of Can uh, brook Canaan. The south, southward to the brook, these cities of Ephraim are the cities of Manasseh, or 
excuse me, these cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was on the north side of the brook, and it ended at the sea. Southward it was Ephraim's, northward it was Manasseh's, and the sea was its border. Manasseh's territory was adjoining, Asher on the north and Issachar on the east. And in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Bethshin and its towns, Iblium and its towns, the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, and the inhabitants of Endor and its towns, the inhabitants of uh, Tanak and its towns, the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns, three hilly regions. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it happened, when the children of Israel grew strong, that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Now, you're going to see there the beginning of a problem, as you're going to see in a number of other places in, in the chapters that we'll cover today. But the beginning of the problem with the land of Israel and with the faithfulness of Israel and the idolatry that they will end up in is right here because they didn't do what God said. Now, here's a point to be made. God all the way through had said, if you will be faithful to me, if you will do what I say, I will drive out the people. So when the people can't be driven out, when the text says that they couldn't do it, what does that tell you? Something about the way they were doing it or how they were doing it or their faithfulness in doing it wasn't what it should have been. Because otherwise, it would have been accomplished. Now, notice that idea is reinforced in these verses to come. Verse 14, then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua. Now, who are the children of Joseph? Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, so Ephraim and Manasseh come to Joseph or come to Joshua together, saying, "We, why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now?" By the way, when they're saying great people, they're talking about population, quantity. Be because you put Ephraim and Manasseh together as one descendant of Joseph, and they're saying, why do we have only one lot? Why do, why do we have only one share? Uh, we are so large. Notice jo Joshua's response. So Joshua answered them, if you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. Joshua's solution to Ephraim, and, and notice this is his tribe. This is his tribe coming to him going, hey, why aren't we getting more? Joshua, you're the leader of the people. Why aren't we getting more? Joshua says, you want more? Fine, you see that mountain, go get it. You, you, want that, you want more? Go earn it, is what he's saying. There's a land right there. Go clear it for yourself. You're a great quantity of people. Go clear the land. It's a forest. If you want the land, go take it. It's a land with giants in it. You want the land? Go take it. So he provides them a solution. It requires what? Work. It requires something on their part. Notice their response. But the children of Joseph said, The mountain country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both those who are in Bethshin and its towns, those who are in the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people and have great power. You shall not have only one lot, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you shall cut it down, and its farthest extent shall be yours, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots and are strong. Ephraim and Manasseh come back to him and say, uh, Joshua, 
you know the Canaanites down in the valley? Uh, they got chariots of iron. Um, how, how about something else? <laughs> That's what they're asking for. How, how, about, how about a different location? Uh, th- that, that mountain country, that's, that's all full of woods, that's all forest, uh, that's a lot of work up there, and the Canaanites down in the valley, they've got chariots of iron, Th- this isn't going to work out. And Joshua says, wait a minute, you came to me saying you're a great people. You are, you are a great in size. Go do it. You are strong, you are mighty, go and do what you've been told to do. And you see here the resistance that comes when the tribes are having to go out and finish taking the land by themselves. What the whole nation together was accomplishing, they were accomplishing well. When it came down to individual responsibility, They started to fall apart. They started to lose the strength and the confidence that they had when they were working together. And that's part of what you're seeing here. Now, it wasn't actually reasonable for the entire nation to go conquer every little mountain and cut down every little forest and and deal with every city. It didn't make sense to do it that way. The point was, Joshua is telling them, you're sufficient. You can do it. Go do it. And there's a point in the maturity of our lives, in our life as a Christian, where we ought to be able to be mature enough where someone says, here's a task, go do it. And we ought to be able to do that. We ought to be advanced to the point we ought to be preparing ourselves and be be building upon the faith and the confidence and the assurance that God's delivered us in the past. He'll do it in the future. All we need to do is obey. And yet so many times that's where we fall apart. We're great when we're following someone else. But the moment we have to step out of the background and step into the foreground, we go, nope, that's not my spot. Nope, can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, the, uh, the, one of the things that Ephraim and Manasseh should have realized is together Ephraim and Manasseh could go and accomplish this. But they had to work together to do it, and they needed to work together to do it. Now, there's something interesting. Think back to the end of the book of Genesis, and think back to when Jacob was giving the Uh, or was speaking with Joseph and with Ephraim and Manasseh when he had Ephraim and Manasseh before him. Jacob said to Joseph when he put the hands on the heads of the two sons, which one did he say would be greater? The older or the younger? The younger. Jacob told Joseph, though Joseph would argue with him, that just like when he, Jacob, became greater than Esau, the same would, be the true of, same would be true of Joseph's children, that the younger would rule over the older. So when you see the tribes divvied up and when you see the amount of land given to Manasseh, which one looks like he's the greater tribe? Manasseh. But do you know which tribe would be the most predominant in the northern kingdom of Israel? Ephraim. Over time, Ephraim would surpass Manasseh in prominence and in size and in power. Though at this point in time, Manasseh is the larger and more predominant tribe. So exactly what Jacob said would come to pass actually does. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> that's true that's true you know uh part of the promise of 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 the land was you're going to receive cities that you you haven't built you're going to see receive vineyards that you haven't planted you're going to receive harvest that you didn't you didn't work for and while they would that didn't mean that there wasn't also going to be other things that they would have to do and the the taking of the land and that's part of it with the valley i mean that's what the valley was the, the Canaanites had the, all of those things. The problem was they hadn't driven the Canaanites out, uh, and they had not uh, removed them from the land. Now, I wanted to point out one other thing before we get out of uh, 18 and 19, and that is uh, when you look at the inheritance, you go all the way through these six chapters, 13 through 19, and the first inheritance discussed, other than the two and a half tribes on the other side, so the two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan, those are discussed. But the predominant inheritance, the largest inheritance, and the most uh, recognized inheritance will go to which tribe? Judah. Why Judah and not the oldest son of Jacob? Do you remember? Okay, so Judah is going to be blessed by Jacob as being the lion. He's going to be, the, be blessed as being the predominant tribe. But what did the oldest son of, do you, does anybody remember who the oldest son of Jacob is? Reuben. Reuben. Reuben committed fornication with one of the handmaids of Jacob and lost his double portion and his preeminence as the oldest son as a result. And the blessing went from Jacob not to Reuben because of his sin, but instead down to Judah. And so Judah would stand as the predominant tribe. Now, in, in a very real sense, the double portion of that idea of the oldest son goes to Joseph. Uh, but there's a, there's, a clear recognition that there's a prominence that departs from Reuben and gets placed in Judah in the blessing and the promise and in the covenant. Because remember, it's the promise of the seed that's made to Abraham and made to Isaac. And it's not going to be Abraham's descendants and the seed coming from Ishmael is going to be through Isaac. And then Isaac, it's going to be promised that it's not going to come through Esau. It's going to come through Jacob. And then Jacob's going to be promised that it's going to come through Judah. Christ will be a descendant of Judah, not of Reuben and not of Joseph, but Judah. And so there's a connection and a covenant promise and a, and a, a line that's drawn through Judah. And of course, the kings would come through Judah as well. So all of that's interesting just as, as you get into this to remember those details from other chapters and to, to bring those forward into this time. Now, one last thing. In the end of chapter 19, we find verse 49. When they had made an end of dividing the land as an inheritance according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua the son of Nun. In all of the time as they've been dividing up the land, as they gave portions and they divvied out, this is your family, this is your family, this is your family, this is your family, this is your tribe, and Ephraim's been given their inheritance a long time ago. Who never received a portion? Who didn't divide for himself a portion? Joshua didn't. As he's dividing up the land, as he's fulfilling the command of God, he doesn't divide for himself a portion. But what do the children of Israel do? They divide it for him. They say, Joshua, this is your portion. And so you see in this the humility of Joshua, and yet the respect and the, the care that the children of Israel had for Joshua. 
that they would make sure that Joshua and his family also received a portion. Notice, according to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for, Timnath Sirah, in the mountains of Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt in it. There, uh, these were the inheritances which Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided as an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So they made an end of dividing the country. So they do all of this work. They do all of this division as they are in Shiloh, which was the original dwelling place of the tabernacle, the original dwelling place of the Ark of the Covenant, and it will remain there all the way up until the time of who? Until the time of David. And then during the time of David, the preparations for what will occur? Preparations for the building of the temple. And then the temple, of course, is going to be built in Jerusalem. Okay, chapter 20. <clears throat> the Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he is struck he, ha he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him beforehand. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the one who is the high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. So, there's a provision that is made in the law of Moses for someone who kills someone else unintentionally. One of the examples that's given if you go back into the actual law and Moses giving the law is if a man is swinging an axe and the head flies off the axe and kills someone. Well, he was swinging the axe to cut down the tree or whatever he was using the axe for, not trying to kill his brother. Well, under you go all the way back to Genesis chapters 9 and 10 when... Noah and his family come off the ark. And what command does God give concerning the one who sheds man's blood? Put him to death. By man shall his blood be shed. The consequence, the punishment, under going all the way back to the time of Noah for committing uh, or for killing someone was you forfeit your life. There, there is a, there's a recognition of a difference in when you're fighting in war. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. But in general, the command was, a, or the, the allowance at least was, by killing someone else, your life is forfeit. You don't get to say, I still have possession of my life because you took someone else's. Okay? Now... When it comes to this, what God is doing and what God has set forth is six cities. And if you look on the map that you have, which in your handouts, that's what the, you have this for. Um, I was going to put it up on the board and I thought, you know what, I'm going to print it because that's a really long way away and this is easier to see. So um, what you have here are the, at least the approximate locations of the six cities. Tell me something you notice kind of right offhand. They're scattered, all over the land. they're scattered all over the land. They're in the north, they're in the central part, they're in the south, and they're on both sides of what? Jordan River. Jordan River. The premise, the idea seems to be, at least by the estimate of some, is that they were no more than a half day's journey 
if you were trying real hard and you would be, they were no more than a half day's journey from anywhere in the land of Israel. An opportunity, a city of refuge, a place of safety for someone who committed uh, or who killed someone else unintentionally. We would call this what in, under our law? Manslaughter. We wouldn't, we wouldn't call it first degree or second degree murder. We would call it manslaughter. It was not an intentional premeditated murder. It was instead in some form or fashion an accidental killing or one that was not premeditated. It was not born out of a hate uh, for someone else. And it's interesting as you go through and read some of the text that that's one of the things that the law brought out. If you hated your brother in advance, you were guilty of murder. Not of, of this that could be allowed, uh, where you could be allowed to live. As a matter of fact, when you step forward into the time of Christ and you look at the Sermon on the Mount, and he begins discussing the, the command where he says, Thou shalt not commit, what's he say? Murder. And then he goes on to say, But I say unto you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you're already guilty of murder. What the Jews had done is they had taken the law that said, as long as you don't kill your brother, you can hate him all you want to. And Jesus said, no, you go back to the law and you find the condemnation, not the consequence. You couldn't put your brother to death because he hated you. You couldn't bring about the exactment of the law, the judgment for murder, because he hasn't actually committed it. But as far as God was concerned, the guilt the one who was guilty of murder was the one who already hated his brother and wanted to kill him. So the Jews were saying, you know what, if you don't go through the physical act, the spiritual, the heart doesn't matter. And God said, no, you're guilty already because you've done it in your heart. And so God here, or Christ, brings forward the recognition that the law set forth a condemnation not just of the physical act, but of the intent behind the act. This is why God has set up these cities of refuge, where if someone kills someone unintentionally, non-premeditated, but this has come about, they can flee to this city and they can receive what? Before they receive refuge, they have to receive something else. They have to receive a trial. You see, under the situation that you had in, in this day and time, if you shed someone's blood, you forfeited your life, and you didn't necessarily get a trial. If the avenger of blood caught up with you, which was usually a family member of the person you killed, if the avenger of blood caught up to you before you got to a city of refuge, you, your life was in your own hands. Good luck. Uh, th th this, was the, this was the posse situation of, of the Wild West at times. If they caught up to you, they, they may not bother with taking you all the way back to town. <laughs> we can hang you here instead of hanging you there. Um, so the avenger of blood w could, had under the law, had provision, the opportunity to exact vengeance if he caught up to him before he reached the city of refuge, or if the individual got to the city of refuge and could not show that what he had done was not premeditated. If someone comes along and says, well, actually, I know you've been feuding with your brother for years. What are you telling me that you'd killed him accidentally now? No. And because the actions of the past identified that there was hate between the two of them, he would be refused from the city of refuge. He wouldn't be allowed to stay. As a matter of fact, there's a condemnation in the law for any city of refuge that would allow one who's guilty of murder to stay. 
they actually had a unique responsibility under their system to try a person, and if he's guilty, they were not to provide him refuge. Instead, he was to be allowed to be handed over to the avenger of blood because he had committed murder. So, the beginning of the refuge begins with the opportunity for a trial. The right to be tried. And that's one of the, even a premise that follows us all the way forward into our American court system. As a, as a member of our society, you have a right to a trial. Uh, now, we, again, different situations, different, different laws, but this concept of having a right to trial is something that the founding fathers drew forward from the Old Testament law and from this idea. But then notice as well that when t if he's provided refuge, if the city elders decide that he, has, he is guilty of an accidental killing and not of murder, he has not fallen under the, the condemnation of the law, he is allowed to remain where? In the city. He is restricted to living in that city. What happens if he goes outside the city? If he goes outside the city and the avenger of blood is waiting on him, you took your life in your own hand. You forfeited your own life. You stay in the city. When did the restriction of remaining in the city cease? At the death of the current high priest. So from the for, the for the period of time where that high priest is alive. Now, if the high priest is 20 years old and you're 50, you better just plan to live out your days unless that high priest's life is cut short. Uh, I got to thinking, huh, I wonder how many people were who, who got in a city of refuge were plotting to kill the high priest. <laughs> you know what? I want to go home. Let's knock this guy off. Uh, I don't think that actually happened. But uh, so here's the individual. He's in the city and he has to remain there. You may be from a different tribe. Your family may be back at home. You may be in a situation almost as if you're in prison, but it's this or death. And so he can come in, he can live, he can prosper, he can become part of the city, but he also has the opportunity at the time of the death of the high priest to return, to return to his home, return to his family, return to his tribe, return to his inheritance, and continue his life. And that was the, the command concerning this. So notice, he shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation for judgment. That is one of the things. He has safety until the trial. He has safety until the time of judgment, no matter what. But then after the judgment, it's dependent upon the, the verdict, as it were. Uh, and until the death of the one who is the high priest in those days, then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. So they appointed Kadesh in Galilee in the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the, mount, in the wilderness of the plain, from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now notice as well that this is a law that was an allowance also for people who weren't Israelites. If you were a stranger, if you were a non-Israelite living in the land and you accidentally killed somebody, just because you weren't a citizen of, of Israel, just because you weren't a descendant of Abraham, didn't mean you didn't have access to the city of refuge. It was available to you as well. Then the houses of the fathers, uh, excuse me, then the heads of the fathers, chapter 21, verse 1, of the houses of, of the Levites came near to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spoke to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded through Moses to give us cities to dwell in, with their common lands for our livestock. 
So the children of Israel gave to the Levites from their inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their common lands. Now the lot came out for the families of the Kohathites, and the children of Aaron, the high priest, who were of the Levites, had 13 cities by lot from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Simeon, and from the tribe of Benjamin. The rest of the children of Kohath had 10 cities by lot from the families of the tribe of Ephraim, from the tribe of Dan, from the half-tribe of Manasseh. And the children of Gershon had 13 cities by lot from the families of the tribe of Issachar, from the tribe of Asher, from the tribe of Naphtali, and from the half-tribe of Manasseh in Bashan. I want to point something out. What son of Levi were Moses and Aaron descendants of? Merari, Kohath, or Gershon? I'll give you a key. They, they, they get their cities together. The Kohathites. Okay? Aaron and, and Moses were descendants of Kohath. Kohath. The Kohathites received their cities in what part of the nation. Three tribes. They received them among Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin. Well, if you're going to look at a map, you're going to notice that Benjamin's here, Judah's here, Simeon's here. And interestingly as well, Jerusalem and Shiloh are also right here. The reason the priests are given the cities they're given is because they're close to the place where they labor, the tabernacle and the, dwell, and, and the temple where it will eventually be. So they're given cities in the vicinity of the place where they will be and where they will labor on behalf of the, the, the Lord. Then the other two sons, Merari and Gershon, are spread out throughout the rest of the, the land of Israel. So I just wanted to point out that God does this reasonably. You're going to be working at the temple. You're a priest. You're going to be here day after day. I'm not putting your city in the top of the nation with Dan. <laughs> I'm going to put it down here in Judah and Benjamin. But there's another point to be made. What part of the nation predominantly was faithful to God throughout their lineage and throughout their history? The north or the south? Judah primarily, which Judah in a very real sense will, will consume Simeon uh, in, in a large part, and Benjamin in a large part will disappear uh, by way of their population. But it will be the part of the nation where the priests live and where Aaron's descendants dwell that will remain faithful. Though there seems to be an indication as the northern tribes depart from God, many of the Levites will actually depart from them. They will, they will come down to the southern part of the land. Let's go through, uh, we don't have a, a whole lot of time to read the rest, but I do want to read verse 43 through 45, though. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. There's something significant about this statement, and that is those who believe in a, in a doctrine called premillennialism, that God is still yet going to come down, Christ is going to come down, he's going to sit on a literal throne in literal physical Jerusalem for a thousand years, and God is finally going to give to Israel the land of Israel. Because he never did it before. They have a big problem with this verse. Because it says, so the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers. If you're waiting on Jerusalem to be reestablished as the center of God's power and Israel to receive back all of her land, you're going to be waiting a long time. 
because God already did what he said he was going to do. And he did it way back here in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. And with that period that's right there at the end of that verse, so ends the argument as to whether or not God gave Israel what he promised them. Everything that God promised Israel, he gave them and came to pass. And what they did with it is what ha you have in history all the way up till this point. And how they were unfaithful and how they lost what God gave them is what you have uh, resulting in where we are today. All right, Joshua chapter 21 questions, 20 and 21. What was the purpose of a city of refuge? Okay, so the one who kills someone accidentally or unintentionally can flee to the city and they will be safe until a trial. And if they're found to have done it unintentionally, they will be safe to remain in the city until the death of the high priest, uh, at which point they can return home. So it's essentially, if we want to boil it down, it's refuge from the avenger of blood when a killer kills some, or when someone kills someone accidentally or unintentionally. So any, any way you answer like that is going to be fine. Uh, you get the, get the basic gist of it. Uh, at a city of refuge, who was to hear the case of a person who had killed someone? The elders of the city. When could an accidental killer leave a city of refuge without fear of an avenger? Okay, specifically here, the answer we're looking for is the death of the current high priest, okay? What was a stranger who traveled among the land of the Israelites to do if he killed a person unintentionally? Flee to the city of refuge. Yes or no, could a killer who hated his victim find safety in the city of refuge? No, he could not. Um... What was the land inheritance of the Levites? All right. Cities among all the tribes of their brethren. What method was used in determining the land inheritances of the Levites? They would cast lots uh, or they, they did it by lots. Okay. Thank you for your attention. You are dismissed. Murray, good to see you, sir.